as Matt said, I am, uh, well, I'm the festival chair of Indicate for one thing, and I'm also a professor. And I'm pleased to report that my evil plan to take over the world is working. So um, I wanted to open with this quote, uh, which I'm sure all of you have read. It's from uh, an article by Lee Alexander, which has become quite, let's just say, notorious. Um, but this quote just has stood out to me and resonated, and I've repeated it to every single person that I've talked to about any issue having to do with diversity in the game industry, because this is the root of the problem. The failure to curate your culture is the root of all evil. <laughs> so I wanted to start with this because I think it's really important. One of the things that came up, this talk was already in the program, and then about two or three weeks ago, we started getting some tweets from people going, you have a safe space statement, you have an inclusivity policy and all of this, and we started corresponding amongst the chairs of this event and as well as the main Indicade management, uh, and we were like, Matt actually said it best when he said, well, Indicate doesn't need an inclusiveness policy. And so I'm gonna talk to you today about why that is. First, I wanna give you a little bit of background of me so you know kind of where I'm coming from with this. Some of you know me, some of you don't. How many people here even know who I am or like have seen me before? Okay, good. So most of you, that's good. And everybody else is over in Sean Pierre's talk, which I almost just went to myself because I love him, but I figured I should stay here and do my talk instead. <coughs> so um, I have been designing games since 1983. I actually started here in New York um, in the mid-90s, late mid to late 90s. I um, went over to academia for a variety of reasons, and I did some things having to do, I've always been interested in inclusivity and diversity, and especially women in games, but also diversity in general. A few things I've done that are notable in this area I was the co-founder of Ludica, which is a women's game collective that is kind of quasi-dormant now. Every once in a while we rear up and do something cool, but we wrote a bunch of articles, probably the best known is the Hegemony of Play that we did for the year 2007. Um, we've also staged a bunch of events that were all about inclusiveness in game creation. We've developed some techniques like board game modification uh, for helping people learn game design kind of in an easy and accessible way. In 2003, I co-curated Alt Control, which is not the same as the Alt Control at GDC. It's a totally different Alt Control. <laughs> um, but this was one of the first um, exhibits of art games. Um, it, it was actually juried. It's kind of a, um, in a weird way, kind of a proto indicate um, But it was a very early instance of a public exhibition in the U.S. of games that are being made in the fine arts context. Um, one of the artists who was in this was Ido Stern, and he actually has a piece upstairs on the third floor, a new piece that you can check out. Um, and then, of course, I am the co-founder of Indicade and the festival chair. We started, in, uh, we started working on it around 2005, 2006. Um, had our first showcase 2007 at E3 and our first festival in 2008 in Bellevue, Washington. And then in 2009, we moved to Culver City, which is an annex city in Los Angeles. And then a couple of years ago, our wonderful New York community decided that they wanted to have an event here, and so here we are. It's so cool. I love it. I love coming to Indicate East. Thank you very much for making this happen, you guys. I also co-curated an exhibition called XYZ, which is weirdly the very first ever exhibition devoted entirely to women's contributions to game development. I know that sounds bizarre, and like in, we did this in 2013, and you're like, really? But as it turns out, nobody had ever done this before. So we try to highlight everything from vintage games, like Centipede that you see over there that was co-designed by Donna Bailey, to uh, art games such as Train, which was done by Brenda Romero. Um, the little girl in the upper left is actually playing Skylanders, which was creative directed by pretty much an all-women team. Um, and of course, for those of you in the know, on the upper right we have Ninja Shadow Warrior, that's Kaho Abe's game. She's also upstairs with the game in the third floor exhibition. Um, and actually that is a picture of the curators of the show playing the game, which I love because it's them and it's clearly very diverse. So, and then um, I just finished spending um, eight years working at Georgia Tech. I'm, I just moved over to Northeastern this semester, but I wanted to briefly talk about what I've done there. Um, I ran a group called the Emergent Game Group, some veterans of whom are sitting in this room, yay. Um, and one of the things I tried to do there was really create a culture that was extremely inviting to diverse and broad people. One of the ways I did that was by coming up with game ideas that were appealing. So for instance, Mermaids 
which is the first game we did, um, although a lot of guys worked on it over the course of its development, it was a game that attracted a lot of girls to my group, but it also taught us all how to make more inclusive games, whether we were female or not, which is cool. Um, Ellis Island was a game about immigration that we developed, um, and then um, we did a pervasive game for Dragon Con, which is the cards you see up there on the right. Those are just a few examples. I also taught a couple of classes. A um, couple of things I want to say about that. As a teacher, it's my responsibility to um, provide my students with a broad palette of knowledge from which to draw their inspiration. So I made a point in all my classes to make sure that they were exposed to a lot of different ideas and a lot of different people. Um, this particular class, I started with this book, The Birth of the Chess Queen, which I highly recommend for instructors. It's um, a feminist history of chess. Um, but what it does is it traces the evolution of the queen piece from all the different cultures through which the game of chess passed since its inception. So it's really interesting because it also talks about the role of women in society in each of those cultures. Um, we looked a lot at board games. This game on the lower right um, is the Landlord's Game, which was the game that Monopoly was actually stolen from. Um, <laughs> some people are probably aware of that. And a few other things up there. But basically we were trying to look at kind of the role of games in culture and gender uh, and representation were kind of recurring themes in the class. I also taught this class, which I'm now teaching at Northeastern, called Experimental Game Design, which is a class about how fine artists have used games in their uh, art practice. So this is also a really interesting um, approach because it uses fine arts as a kind of a path into games. A um, couple examples of art projects on the lower right is a happening that we staged. We studied Alan Capro, and then I gave the students a bunch of materials, and we went out in the quad at school and made this crazy art happening. Um, the lower left is the physical version of um, rock band drum edition, where people walk across the pavement, and each time they take a step, the person at the drum plays the correct um, drum piece associated with the color of that lane. And then the uh, up, up, upper right, which I love, is the white Rubik's Cube. These are all student projects from this class that were inspired. I had to put the Yoko Ono white chest because it's obviously connected. So now I'm going to actually get to down to business here. Um, and I apologize in advance for the ugly texty slides. I actually hardly ever use these kinds of slides, but as I was doing this today, I realized that for the purposes of what I want to talk about, this is the best um, and most clear way to communicate. It also means that if anyone wants this PowerPoint presentation, they can just get it and like you have it and you can use it. So 12 steps to cultivating an inclusive community. These are all things that I have done and tried and iterated on, um, and I can assure you that they all work really well. Some of them are more broad, and some of them are very specific, but if you implement, I would say all of them, it's great, but you could even just do a few, and it would help you a lot. So step number one, admit there's a problem. <laughs> This seems obvious, but unfortunately there are a lot of people who don't think there's a problem, and this is a problem, because if you don't know there's a problem, then the problem will never go away. So um, it's very easy if you're in a position of privilege to say there isn't a problem because the problem doesn't actually belong to you. Um, so a couple things I recommend to people. First, try employing empathy, like, oh, I can feel what you're feeling, and therefore if you are feeling bad, I feel bad too. If that doesn't work, you can employ thinking about someone you care about, like, oh, my girlfriend is getting harassed on Twitter. <laughs> um, either way, that will lead you to the conclusion that perhaps there is a problem. Um, we do not live in a post-racist, post-sexist society, and if you think that, well, you shouldn't even probably be in this room. Or maybe you should, I don't know. Um, two, now this seems kind of obvious, but it's very important, care. <laughs> even if you know there's a problem, you don't necessarily have to care about it. Um, I think it's really important to care about people different from you. I think it's really important that even if you don't care, and this is kind of something I just recently stumbled upon, there is a lot of data to support, like scientific data to support the fact that diversity is actually better for everyone. Uh, for instance, diverse companies produce more ideas, they produce more innovation, they appeal to broader audiences, and they make more money. There's actually like all of this research to support this. So even if you hate diversity, there's actually a very legitimate commercial reason to embrace it. Um, and a little bit of empathy really goes a long way. Be willing to make a sustained effort. 
My favorite thing is, oh, we invited a woman to our conference, now we're done. Uh, no, that's not how it works. You need to care enough, not just to care, but to actually do something and to do it over a prolonged period of time through multiple tactics. Um, you really need to be willing to make the effort. You need to be willing to change yourself, your culture, the culture of your community, whatever it takes to evolve in this way. Um, you need to be doing it all the time. You need to reassess all the time. Like, is this working? Maybe this isn't working. Maybe we should try something else. It's okay to make mistakes. I think a lot of people are afraid to try to tackle anything because, oh my God, what if we say the wrong thing? I, it's better to try and fail <laughs> and know why you failed than it is not to try at all. And I think it's really important to remember that this is an ongoing commitment. You can never win, ever. It's never done. We're never, oh, we're all inclusive, everything's cool, we're done. It's not gonna happen. But you can constantly improve. Communicate this is very important. Listen and talk. Listen first, though. Start by listening. Um, get feedback from the people who are coming from the diverse communities that you want to engage with. Don't shame people. Give them loving guidance. I've been in a couple of situations where old school feminists gave presentations to new school game feminists and got completely ripped to shreds. Totally unnecessary. This person is on your side. Just talk to them and tell them, hey, ideas have changed. This is what we're thinking about now. No need to shame people. And please, for the love of God, don't insult people on Twitter. OK. <laughs> Seriously, that is just, don't do it. It's horrible. Uh, educate. So I kind of alluded to this earlier. Educate yourself and others. Learn what terms like microaggression mean. Who knows what microaggression means? Cool. So for the rest of you, ask the people that raise their hand after the talk. <laughs> um, learn from other disciplines such as or areas such as the civil rights movement, the feminist movement, this, this feedback, uh, queer rights movements. All those movements have done this before us, and we can learn from them. Um, we can also, uh, yeah. I just said that already. And educate everyone. Educate even the people that are not different. Everybody needs, to be, we all need to be educated. Um, very important, put diverse people and people who care in leadership roles. If you do that, if you guys were here for the opening yesterday, you will notice that uh, Matt and Claire very proudly proclaimed that we have 50% female speakers at this conference, which is unprecedented at a games conference, as, I sure, as I'm sure you know. That was done on purpose. Um, so put people who care about that in position to make those kinds of decisions. Please avoid, and, and actually this naturally avoids creating the inclusiveness ghetto problem, which is all the women go on the gender panel, which I can't tell you how many of those I've been on, where the, all the women in the entire conference are on a panel called Gender Games, hence creating the people of gender problem, which, me, which basically is this idea that people who aren't women don't have a gender. Um, <laughs> and then, uh, yeah, if you do this one thing, if you did nothing else in your entire program and you just did this, this solves a lot of problems automatically. Inclusivate your systems. <laughs> a couple quick examples. In my research group, we had something called the talking stick because it's a pretty well-known fact amongst linguistic scholars and educators that if you put a bunch of men and women together in a conversation, then males will tend to dominate. It's not anything bad, it's just the way it is. So what we did was everybody would get the projector cable for a period of time to talk, and that meant every single person at the table got to speak at some point during the conversation. Other people have employed, I know Clara uses a doll that she has her students hand around with the same function. These are very simple techniques. Gender inclusive bathrooms. Someone came up to me yesterday and was like, do you have a gender neutral bathroom? And I'm like, no, but I'll walk you into the ladies room. So think about these things. They're not that hard to deal with, really. Make sure that your systems uh, and procedures are in invite everyone. Am I good on time? Yes. OK. Be careful what you privilege. This is a really tricky one, OK? This is hard. This one is much harder than some of the other ones. Certain things, certain topics, certain skills, certain disciplines tend to be privileged over others. And by privileging those, you inadvertently privilege certain people. So I'll give you a couple of examples here. Coding is more important than art. People who write code are treated like they're better and smarter than people who make art. Now I know why Gonzalo was wearing the baseball cap. Um, so they get paid more. If you look at the um, IGDA surveys, uh, coders get paid way more than artists. 
Um, this is a natural way of discriminating. If you want to discriminate against people, make coding the most important thing. That's a really good way to do it. Um, serious games versus entertainment games. Um, terms like it's not a game or it's not a real game are all tactics that, that exclude people. So we want to avoid those. Uh, invite communities and practices that are already diverse to yours. This is one of my favorite ones because it's so easy to do and nobody ever thinks of it. So when we started IndieCade, we went to the Game Developers Conference and we went to the Indie Summit and it was all full of white guys. And then we went to the Serious Game Summit and it was totally diverse. And then we went to the, the uh, Casual Game Summit and there were lots of women there, et cetera, et cetera. And we were like, what if we just invited all the indie game developers who were in the Serious Summit and the Casual Summit to the indie community and all of a sudden, here come all, all the people of color and gender that were being excluded previously. Um, fine art is another area, educational games, academic research games. There are actually more women in academia than there are in industry right now. So these are all ways to create a more inclusive environment. Include and acknowledge. Be sure and include diverse designers when you talk about games. Include diverse characters when you make games. Uh, include diverse disciplines and avoid inadvertently making people invis invisible. Treat everyone with respect. 11, encourage your community to monitor itself. Empower people to intervene when they see something is inappropriate. Creating a safe environment is all of our responsibility. One of the things I hate is like, we have to have a policy and we have to enforce it and I have to be mom or police or whatever. It's like, no, we're all in this together. We all have to treat each other respectfully and support each other. And that's kind of how I've treated this issue from day one. And finally, number 12, <laughs> don't be an asshole. <laughs> this is my slogan for IndieCade. Like I said, we're on this together. It takes a village to raise a festival, and that's how we do it. So I'm done, and we can have a little bit of Q&A maybe. Great, thank you. <laughs>